present Bernard Hawkfall as Harry Lawson and Jeffrey Banks as Professor Van Hardewig in A Journey to the Center of the Earth. The novel by Jules Verne, adapted for radio in eight parts by Howard Jones. Part six, The Hurricane. Before I resume my account of our amazing adventures beneath the surface of the Earth, let me remind you of what I have already told you. My uncle is that now celebrated German scientist, Professor von Hardwig. One day, in a book my uncle had recently purchased, we came upon a scrap of ancient parchment covered with runic characters. This, we discovered, was the writing of a 16th century alchemist named Arne Sacknesem. In a few words, Sacknesem described how he had made a journey to the center of the earth by descending the crater of an extinct volcano in Iceland. My uncle, being impulsive as well as clever, insisted that we follow in the footsteps of Sacknesem. So, accompanied by our faithful guide, Hans Bjorka, we too descended the Snæfells volcano. How we nearly died of thirst, how I became separated from my companions and all but lost my reason, how we set sail on a raft on a great subterranean ocean called the Central Sea, all this I have already told you. And then we witnessed a fearful battle between prehistoric monsters. The Ichthyosaurus, or great fish lizard, and a sea crocodile, the Plesiosaurus. After three terrifying hours, both monsters suddenly vanished under the waves. But presently the Plesiosaurus rose again to the surface, riding horribly in its death agonies. We watched it until it ceased to struggle and sank from our sight. And I thought, so much for the Plesiosaurus. But what about the victor, the Ichthyosaurus? Has he gone down to some undersea cavern to rest and lick his wounds? Or will he reappear to destroy us? Suddenly, Hans said, Ah, the wind, the wind, he flashes. See the sail is filled. We fly, we fly. Wednesday, August 19th. The wind, which is now blowing violently, has helped us to escape from the scene of the battle. With his usual imperturbable calm, Hans remains at the rudder. But my uncle, who for a short time had been roused from his reverie by the fight, fell again into a brown study, his eyes fixed morosely on the widespread ocean. I confess that even I find our voyage has become monotonous. But I have no desire to have the monotony broken by the perils and adventures of yesterday. Thursday, August 20th. The wind is now north-northeast and blows very irregularly in fitful gusts. The temperature is high. We progress at an average speed of about ten and a half miles an hour. About twelve o'clock, we heard a sound like thunder. I note down this fact without suggesting any reason for it. My uncle had his own theory. Hmm. Not thunder, I think. No, no. It is my belief that there is some distant rock or island. Uh, what we hear is the sea breaking violently against it. If uh, Hans, leave the tiller, plant the mast. Up with you. So, up. Now, look all around you. What can you see? I can see. Yes, I can see nothing. Nothing? Three hours passed. The sound had now become like a mighty cataract, far, far off. Uncle? No, well, Harry, what is it? I believe that's a cataract of some sort. Nonsense. We're advancing towards some gigantic waterfall, some, some terrible abyss. I disagree. I disagree entirely. I could not help reflecting that if we were to be swept down into some abyss, the professor would welcome it. 
For it would be that swift and vertical descent to the center of the earth which he is so anxious to make. But what, in fact, was this strange sound? And where did it come from? It struck me that if it came from a cataract, as I believed, if, in other words, this great underground sea cascaded into a lower basin, the current would become stronger and its swiftness would afford me some idea of the peril which faced us. Accordingly, I cast an empty bottle into the sea and watched it anxiously. Current? The current simply did not exist. The bottle lay to leeward without any movement. About four o'clock, my uncle said, Hans, oblige me by climbing the mast again. That's it. That's it. Now look carefully. Very carefully. Aha! He has seen something at last. I think so, uncle. Hans! I come, I come. Well, what is it? What have you seen? It is there. To the falls, master. A great spout of water rising from the waves. This is what you saw, Hans? Yes, master. A spout of water. Then it's probably another marine monster? Perhaps, my boy. <laughs> Perhaps. In which case, may I suggest we give it a clear berth? Let's steer away from it. To the west. We steer for the south. For the south? Uncle, that is madness. For the south, I say. For the south. At eight o'clock in the evening, reckoning as above ground where there is night and day, we were not more than two leagues from the great monster. Its black, enormous body lay motionless on top of the water. Its length could not be less than a thousand fathoms. I recalled that sailors have been said to have gone ashore on sleeping whales, mistaking them for land. What could this terrible monster be? The water spout rose to a height of at least 500 feet, breaking into spray with a sullen roar. And all the time we were advancing on it, I cried out to my uncle to stop, stop, before it was too late. This did not come this way to stop. You're mad, uncle. If you don't stop, I... I'll cut away the sail. I'll Monster! Well, this monster, it is an island. An island? <laughs> The monster's an island, Harry. What does it I, I, I don't believe it. What, well, what about this great spout of water? It is a geyser, Master Harry. Are you sure? Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> In my country, Iceland, there are many such geysers. Oh, enough of talk. We sail to this island, Hans. Oh, yes, Master. But we wear the geyser. If he falls on us, we are wrecked. Therefore, I think I steer for the other end of the island. I was the first to leap onto the rock. My uncle followed. Hans remained seated on the raft, a man above any childish thrills of excitement. The professor and I were now walking on granite mixed with siliceous sandstone. It shivered under our feet like the sides of a boiler and was burning to the touch. One moment, Harry. Uh, have you brought the thermometer? Yes. This water is running from the basin where the geese are right. There's now... What is the temperature? 163 degrees. So? And that, Uncle, contradicts all your theories on the subject, doesn't it? Uh, what are you saying? Explain yourself. Well, the water obviously comes from some place where the heat is intense, and that place is directly beneath our feet. <laughs> Certainly it is beneath our feet. What about it? Well, doesn't it confirm the central heat theory? The deeper you descend, the hotter it becomes. Oh, the water is hot, and that's all. What does it prove against my theory? Oh, nothing. Nothing, I suppose. But, Uncle, sooner or later we shall arrive in some region where the central heat will be insupportable. It will be as hot, on, as, sir. as hot as the Hades of the ancients, believed by them to be the center of the earth. Now, we shall see, we shall see. But now we must... Uh, we must give a name to this island. Hmm. <laughs> yes, indeed. I named this Harris Island. Thank you, Uncle. You don't need to thank me. I care nothing for your theories. Nothing at all. Come. At this time, we were going. So at length, we took our departure, going round the rather dangerous projecting rocks on the southern side. Hans had taken advantage of our halt to carry out some repairs to the raft, not before they were needed, I might add. 
Before we set sail, I made some observations and calculations to put down in my journal. Since we left Port Gretchen, we had traveled 270 leagues, more than 800 miles on this great subterranean sea. We were, therefore, 620 leagues from Iceland and exactly under England. Friday, August 21st. This morning, the wind has freshened. We make good progress. The sight and sound of the magnificent geyser have disappeared. And the weather, if I may call it such, is about to change very suddenly. The atmosphere is close and sultry. The clouds seem to be tumbling towards the sea, a dark olive in color. In the south, they are piling up like enormous balls of cotton, one above the other in confusion. The sea is comparatively calm. There can be no doubt that the air is saturated, so to speak, with electricity. My hair literally stamped on end, as if under the influence of a galvanic battery. I am writing at ten in the morning. The portents of a storm become more and more pronounced. The wind has softened as if taking breath for a renewed attack. Above us, the vast funereal pall of cloud hangs like a huge sack. I try to ignore the menacing signs all about us, but I cannot help remarking it looks as if we are in for some dirty weather. The professor says nothing, simply shrugs his shoulders. He's in a detestable temper. I point to the horizon. There's a big storm brewing, Uncle. The clouds are coming lower and lower, as if they mean to suffocate us. Silence. Nothing stirs. Now the wind has dropped entirely. It is as if nature has ceased to breathe. The sail droops in folds on the mast. We are motionless on a dark sea that is as smooth as glass. I reflect that if the wind rises with sudden violence, our sail may be the death of us. I say, lower the sail. It's only common sense. No. I tell you a hundred times, no. It will in strike and do its worst. Let the storm sweep us where it will. Only let me see the glimmer of a coast. The line of rocky cliffs. Even if they dash us into a thousand pieces. But, Uncle. You will keep up the sail, whatever happens. Keep it up. The professor has scarcely spoken when the storm bursts. The rain falls like solid rods of steel. The wind rises to a raging tempest blowing from the most distant corners of the cavern from every point of the compass. It roars, it screams, it shrieks like demons let loose. The blast leaps wildly over the waves. My uncle is cast headlong to the deck and with difficulty I drag myself towards him. He clings with might and main to the end of a rope and gazes with pleasure and delight at the spectacle of the unchained element. And that the rudder never moves a muscle. The mast holds firm against the hurricane, but the sail bellies out like a bubble about to burst. I shout, the sail! The sail! We must lower the sail! Must I tell you again? Leave the sail alone! And now to the fearful claps of thunder are added dazzling flashes of lightning such as I have never seen before. The flashes cross one another, hurled down from every side. Hailstones striking the metal of our boots and our weapons are luminous. The waves rising above us like fire-eating monsters. The crests surmounted by great cones of flame. Sunday, August 23rd. I have almost lost count of time. My notes are incomplete, loose, and vague. The night has been fearful, something not to be described. We are still carried forward at tremendous speed. Where have we got to? Where are we going? Our ears literally bleed. 
we are unable to exchange a word, to hear each other speak. My uncle lies full length, silent, motionless, and never moved. It seems this terrible storm will never end. We are utterly broken by fatigue. We are heading southeast, always southeast. Already we have covered 200 leagues from Harry's Island. We have lashed every piece of cargo to the raft. Otherwise, it must have been swept away. Also, we have tied ourselves to the mast, each man lashing the other. The waves sweep over us so that we are often underwater. Three days and three nights we have not spoken. We open our mouths, we move our lips, but no sound comes. My uncle contrived to get his head close to mine. From pure intuition, I fancy, he said to me. We are lost. So now I take out my notebook and I write as well as I can. Take in sail. He nods his head. And at this moment, a disc or ball of fire appears on the very edge of our raft. The sail is carried away bodily. I see it swept up to a prodigious height, like a kite. The ball of fire, half white, half blue, and about ten inches across, runs here, there, everywhere. It is swept towards us, towards my uncle. A stench of nitrous gas fills the air. And I am ready to choke. On my feet. I cannot move my feet. This globe of electric fire has turned all the iron on board into magnets or lodestones. Our instruments, our tools. And then suddenly the ball of fire bursts. A stupendous flash of light. It shows me my uncle cast to the deck, apparently senseless. And there, Hans at the rudder, grim, motionless, imperturbable. Then, all about us, darkness. 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 Tuesday, August 25th. The hurricane continues. Where are we going? Where? Where? Our speed is terrific. We must have passed under England, under the Channel, under France, probably under the whole extent of Europe. Master Harry! What's that? Someone called my name? Master Harry! Master Harry! You hear? Here. Yes, I hear. And oh, the wind. And something else. There is land yonder. <laughs> the sea is smashing on rocks. They are close. They are very close. Oh, land. No, no, it can't be. You imagine it. Exactly what happened when our raft was cast upon the rocky shore, it is impossible for me to say. I felt myself thrown into the raging seas, and I was saved from death only by the determination of the faithful Hans, who seized me and carried me far out of the reach of the waves and laid me down upon a wide expanse of sand. And here, some time later, I found myself in the company of the professor. Some overhanging rocks afforded us a slight protection, and under this shelter, Hans prepared some food, which I, however, was unable to eat. Exhausted by three weary days and nights, we fell into a heavy sleep. Next day, when I awoke, the change was magical. Every trace of the storm had vanished. The wind was gentle and the sea quite calm. 
I was greeted by the first happy remarks I had heard from my uncle for many a day. Well, well. How are you, Harry, my dear boy? <laughs> Have you slept soundly? Well, what is the matter with you? Cannot you say whether you slept well or not? Yes, I've slept well, Uncle. But every bone in my body aches. Oh, oh you appear to be very cheerful this morning. Never happier in my life, dear boy. We have at last reached our long-wished-for pause. Do you mean this is the end of our expedition? No, no, not yet. But we have reached the further side of the great central sea, the sea which I thought would never end. So now we can resume our journey by land, our real journey to the center of the earth. Uncle, what about getting back? Back to the surface? Getting back? What a question to ask! When we reach the center of the earth, we shall find a new road to lead us back to the surface. And if there is no new road? Then we shall turn about and return by the way we came. In that case, we shall have to repair the raft. And what about the equipment? Hmm, there's very little missing as far as I can see. We have lost uh, all our guns. We haven't a weapon between us. No weapons. Only this gunpowder. Well, as we have no guns, all we do is give up the idea of hunting. But uh, our scientific instruments, Hansel, what about them? Uh, here, the thermometers. The chronometer, <laughs> the compass, uh, and this, uh, um, what you call it? Uh, uh, the manometer, the most valuable of all. With this, I can calculate our depth as we progress. With this, I shall tell when we have reached the center of the Earth. And food. How much is left, huh? Well, the food is here, in these boxes. Uh, there are biscuits, salt meat, fried fish, freedom. Uh, it is all good. If we are careful, it was last two, three, four months. Yes, four months, I think. Four months? Oh, then we shall have plenty of time to reach the center of the earth and to come back again. And with the food that is left over, I will give a grand dinner to all my scientific colleagues in Hamburg. <laughs> but at this moment, Uncle, we are somewhere under the Mediterranean. That may be so, but uh, whether we are under the Mediterranean or under Turkey or the Atlantic Ocean cannot be decided until we are sure that the storm does not drive us out of our course. Mm, however, we can easily decide by taking our bearings. Come, let us... The professor stepped out eagerly towards the rock where Hans had laid out our instruments. He was gay and light-hearted, to all appearances a young man again. I had never known him so amiable and cheerful. I followed him, anxious to know whether I had made any mistake in my estimate of our position. My uncle took up the compass, gave it a shake to bring it to life, placed it again on the rock, and bent his eyes eagerly over it. For some moments he was silent. Slowly he rubbed his eyes and looked again. And then... Oh. No. It is not possible. What's the matter, Uncle? Uncle, what's wrong? Uh, I cannot speak. Look, look at the compass. Uh, the needle's pointing to the shore. Exactly. Then the shore is to the north. The sea is to the south. You realize what this means? Now, wait a minute. Perhaps it's not working properly, Uncle. I'll give it another shake. There. Let it settle. It has settled precisely as before. The needle points to the shore. There must have been a slant of wind during the storm. We've been carried back to the shores of Port Gretchen. The shores we left. Apparently forever so many days ago. And our voyage, the fearful dangers we have passed through amount to nothing. Every hour, every minute on the raft has been so much time lost. It is cruel. Cruel. Yes, Uncle. And in my opinion, the time has come to reconsider our position. It is useless to struggle against the impossible. Fate, place, means, fire, tricks. All the elements, air, fire, water, all have combined against me. Well, now they shall learn what a determined man can do. I will not yield. I will not retreat from this. <laughs> I shall see who is going to triumph in this immortal contest. Man or nature. Forward, I say. Forward to the center of the earth.
the sixth installment of A Journey to the Center of the Earth, adapted by Howard Jones from the novel by Jules Verne. The cast was as follows. Harry Lawson was played by Bernard Hotswell, Professor von Hartwig by Jeffrey Banks, and Hans Bjorker by John Danklish. It was produced in the north of England by Trevor Hill. We invite you to listen to the seventh installment of this serial next Thursday at the same time, that is 5.25, on this service, that is Radio 4. And the title of the episode next week is The Mysterious Dagger.